Thank you very much. Now to our commentator. You should switch only this mic. All right. After, after I talk, <laughs> Oh, are you on the switch? No. Doesn't matter. Right. I, well, I will so, so, Professor Ram Shachar is a, got his PhD at Oxford. Um, uh, he is a professor of law at, uh, uh, at the uh, Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya, where he served as the first dean. Um, he got you know, numerous prizes, many articles, uh, visited many places, but I think the most important thing and the reason I thought that this is a match made in heaven, kudos to the organizer, is that Professor Shachar is the embodiment of the, of the legal historian as detective. His work on the Israeli criminal code and more recently on the Israeli declaration of uh, independence are both a superb detective work, it's combining crim text, criminal declaration. <laughs> <laughs> text and context. So, <laughs> Yoram. Thank you. <clears throat> so let me start with uh, you know re re <laughs> re raising the issue of metho methodology. I'll do so very briefly and in a much less eloquent way than most of you did. So, but. Let's discuss mythology for just a minute. So first there was law, and then we got board visits. So we created law end, one end. And then we got bored with law one end, and are now creating, in the process of creating, law end end, uh, law double end. We were bored in the sense that we all felt there was little else that a single end could do for law, inform the law, improve the understanding of the law. Now. Anat uh, invited us in her, her original call to ponder the relations between two such ends, namely art and history, and I'm aware of the fact that she used uh, in or as, but to my mind there still remain end and. So it's law and history and art or literature. So how do these ends tend to each other? Stand to each, to each other. What are, what are the relations between the two? There are two, simplistically, there are two formal options here, one soft one, where both ends act on the law, each of them acts on the law in parallel, each contributing directly to legal understanding, and a hard one where they act in series, one on the other, one informing the other, which in turn, turn informs the law. So, at least we, where we are here. By the way, this used to be my office many, many years ago. This was the view that I saw from the nostalgia. All right. So legal history is a given, mainly because we are in the Berg Institute right now, right? So institutionally, we are here. So legal history is law and history is a given. How, asks Anat, can literature or art contribute? Stephen Williams tells us that historians know text and context. They are skillful with text and context and can greatly improve legal inquiry by applying this skill or these skills. They are probably separated from each other and perhaps work best, if at all, in a combination. So how do they contribute to legal inquiry? Quick query, how legal is the detective inquiry uh, in a whodunit case. It, it is legal in the sense that the environment is legal, but I'm not sure that this is a legal inquiry, but this is, uh, this is um, a marginal remark. But what is uh, Stephen Wilf tell, telling us about literature? Uh, literary theories also know text and context and a bunch of other text-related stuff. So can a literary approach only parallel the historical approach and given a legal problem, only add their voice to an already excellent advice when reading law, read text extra carefully and be extra sensitive to context? I think that Anat hoped for a different answer. I think that she invited support for a stronger exponential claim, namely that legal historians are excellent lawyers 
but literature can in some sense make them even better legal historians, at, le at least legal historians. That literature acts on and improves their historical methods, method perhaps the way mathematics can make legal economists, excuse the expression, better legal economists without directly impact, impacting the law. So perhaps literature gives structure, language, skill to legal historians to use on the law. Um, I think that Stephen has taken Anat's question seriously in Steve's unique fashion. I've known him for some years, perhaps more seriously than Anat meant. Um, but the result is truly glorious. It is an engaging study of a literary genre, a brilliant literary analysis of two series at least two series of detective stories by two very different writers, and most importantly, I think it offers a wise comment on the limit of both text and context, perhaps even in combination, as tools of illumination. I think that Steve is telling us that legal historians can improve their skills by reading literature carefully, that creators of fiction, I'm now talking about the authors, the creators of fiction and their interpreters, the critics, can teach historians valuable lessons on both text and context and their limits. In this short comment, I cannot possibly improve on Steve's brilliant, Stephen's brilliant insights, so I will limit myself to two points, both piggybacking, piggybacking on two charming allusions in Steve's nearly endless stream of association. I have chosen two side figures in Stephen's stream marginal side figures only in this specific context, but I suspect both are very dear to Steve and neither of them marginal in any other sense. One is Atticus Finch, the other Shlomo Dov Goitain. Stephen uses Atticus to tell us that we never really know a man until we stand in his shoes and walk around in them, that's the, a that's the full quote and Shlomo Dov to warn us that some of us are so fundamentally different from others that we can't possibly stand in their shoes even if we tried, or um, I'll use another metaphor in a minute. Um, authors are true wizards of, of uh, fiction, perhaps William Styron is a good example, constructing context, realigning reality, creating sense from chaos, solution from impasse, Lawyers may think they are good at it, and the historians who study them may applaud their own genius in uncovering it, but authors out outdo us all. Shlomodov Goitain was a revered historian of the Cairo Geniza. He knew text and, con and context. Text was almost, for him, was almost invariably legal. Contracts, bills, boring stuff. As hard as he read them, as meticulously as he deciphered every comma, many of the texts would not make sense without context. So this guy buys that guy's house in Cairo for this sum of money this year and promises to sell it back two years later for that sum of money, suspiciously slightly different sum of money. Two other guys do the same. And now a woman and a guy do the same. So what's going on? Where is the sense? What's the market? Where is the consumption? What is going there in the 11th century in, in Jewish observe in Cairo? What goes on, says Goitain, is these are long distant, distance merchants, and they are observant Jews. Merchants need credit. Credit means usury. And observant Jews don't do usury. Sort of don't do. They do. Sort of don't. <laughs> These are not bills of sale. These are bills of loan. It's all a bluff. It's a fiction. It takes a good historian to call the bluff, but it may not be enough. Quote, Goitan would ask whether a secular scholar would completely understand a person from the Middle Ages for whom religion is the overriding concern in life. But perhaps, I attribute this to Steve, Stephen, but I'm not sure now. 
but perhaps authors can outperform scholars. Perhaps the William Styrons of the world do better. Outperform scholars, even great historians, even legal historians, and completely understand even distant others, distant in truly fundamental ways. So perhaps author A. B. or Aleph Bet Yehoshua, though secular Jew, can do better than historian S. D. Goitein in reading history, reading law, and reading through fiction. If I'm correct, this is what Anat is wishing us to say. She, I think, believes so of Dickens and Hardy and the Brontes. So back to Atticus Finch. He is a lawyer conjured by Harper Lee to defend a black man wrongly accused in Macomb, Alabama of raping a white girl. Speaking to his little barefoot daughter who would rather not wear shoes at all, he unleashes on her an even greater challenge of fictional metamorphosis greater than wearing the shoes of another and walking in them. Now the quote is, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. Walking around in another person's skin, God forbid. So can anyone ever climb into a different skin, let alone walk around in it? A recent Israeli tragedy offers an iffy answer. It happened in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Israel, not Jerusalem, what was it, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and not even Macomb, Alabama. But a black man was wrongly accused of raping a white girl in Jerusalem. He was a Muslim to boot, she a Jew. And he was not yet even a slave, he was just a laborer, so he kept his native name. He was and still is a Muhammad. She was not, we don't know her name. A miracle happened in Jerusalem, and he was acquitted by three judges who, without scholars and artists, may just may have managed to climb into his skin, his language, his culture, and interpret his text empathically. Empath empathically? Yeah. He was acquitted with empathy. With empathy. Yeah. He was acquitted. But he waited 18 unnecessary months in jail for the miracle while Jerusalem refused to climb into his skin. Jerusalem, in fact, detested his skin and he was made to pay. The story is as complex of, as any of Caldwell or Gore, Gore's whodunits. Here's the essence of the story. A Jerusalem girl celebrated high school graduation among classmates in an estate called symbolically paradise, Gan Eden, paradise estate. There was alcohol, of course, there's always alcohol. She had sex in the bushes with a classmate, not an intimate friend, a classmate, Jewish, of course. She then probably had sex with others, but all traces of this second incident were skillfully erased. And then around four o'clock, 4 a.m., she entered Muhammad's room climbed into his bed and had quick sex with him. Muhammad was asleep when she had entered his bed. He was, still is, a refugee from, from the Sudan, speaking neither, neither Hebrew nor Arabic, and he was there to clean the mess in paradise One party was, once party was over. Instead, he was put in jail for 18 months, accused of rape. She acted as, as if she consented, but in fact she did not said the girl when the party was all over in the morning, and so said police, and so said prosecution, and so said the community of Jerusalem before salvation, long before acquittal. One sentence by the girl symbolizes it best. I come from a religious home, she says, Jewish religious home. I will never have sex with a stranger. Well, she did. Especially not a goy, a non-Jew, a Gentile. And then she added, a guy whose skin color was smeared all, all over my body. So what is, what is she doing here? She honestly had no recollection of most of the event, and she's honestly trying to make sense of it. But like Mayela Duell, is that the correct pronunciation in Macomb, she makes the utmost effort to reject any possibility of fraternization, of the coming together of bodies, of climbing into his skin, God forbid, or even into her own true skin, 
her own true desires. <coughs> it took three judges to do the climbing, but they did. Muhammad told the cellmate that the girl was sick when she climbed into his bed. What did he mean by sick? If he meant drunk, he was guilty. If he meant the kind of girl who climbs into strange men's bed in the middle of the night and rapes them, he was innocent. The judges preferred the letter, thank God, at least the option, at least the doubt, and acquitted. The cellmate, the informer, was an Arab who knew neither Sudanese nor the ways of Sudan. Much of the rest of the meaning, what he meant by, see, by saying that, she was, that he realized that she was sick when she entered his bed. So the rest of the meaning was lost on the trans, in the translation into Hebrew. Text lost its meaning on the way and the judges refused to take it. Literally on face value, they at least tried to abide by Atticus or Harper Lee wisdom. Why am I say, why I'm telling all, all this? I say all this partly because Steve himself offers his own context in characterizing the direct ancestors of modern Israel in trying to understand Batya Gur and those who dwell in it. He speaks of our parents. He says mythological, mythological, so I'm not sure what he means exactly, but he speaks of our parents as Holocaust survivors, refugees from Arab pogroms. What I'm saying is things were never as simple as this. Society was never as close as this. Meaning was never as clear as this. Even in history, in real history, but they are certainly not as simple as that today. Muhammad Fadul is a Holocaust survivor, a refugee from Arab pogrom, but his Holocaust and pogrom occurred in Africa and he is here with us, probably to stay. And he is black, and we'll all need to be able to stand in his shoes and climb into his skin in order to understand him and do justice. So why am I telling all this? One possible reason is that Steve is such a wonderful storyteller that I needed to tell one of my own. Another is perhaps the hope that as good as the best of scholars can do, we need a truly great author to make some sense of the hell we call paradise now in Israel. Dickens is dead, but Yehoshua is alive and kicking, so there is hope. And if not, if not perhaps Leora Bilsky. I'll try to convince <laughs> 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 right, so Thank you.